All right, all right. Super excited for this live. Thank you all for connecting here. Super, super excited. Let me just uh, gather a couple of things here. All right, let's get started. Uh, welcome everybody to the Jorge Contreras uh, YouTube channel. Super excited to have every single one of you here today. You likely heard about this. Uh, it's actually my very first YouTube live. I do Instagram lives all the time, but it's the first time that I do one on YouTube. You probably heard about it through maybe my email or through my Instagram. So either way, excited whether you're watching this live or on the replay, you're probably here because you are someone who wants to start your Airbnb empire without owning real estate. And so I wanted to go live today to go over some free training to help you accomplish uh, just that. And before I go into the actual uh, story, I wanted to just give you guys a little bit of background about myself so you guys know uh, who the speaker is. So again, my name is Jorge Contreras, uh, 34 years young. I reside in Los Angeles, California. I've been a full-time entrepreneur now for 15 years, a real estate investor for 10 years, and I started my Airbnb business uh, five years ago. Uh, currently, we're doing over uh, six figures a month, so well over a million dollars just from our Airbnb business, and that's implementing the purchasing strategies, the subleasing strategies, and the management strategies as well. So there's definitely a lot that I've learned uh, over the years, and I'm just very excited to help other people uh, create not just financial freedom, but time, location, and financial freedom uh, utilizing the strategies that I've learned. I actually started with this book right here, Rich Dad, Poor Dad, in uh, 2015. Shortly after that, I actually became a student at the Rich Dad Coaching Company. And then I became a trainer there where they would fly me across the country, facilitating uh, real estate uh, investing education. And I became inspired to basically start my own company, uh, really focusing on the niche and the strategy of short-term rentals. And that's what we're gonna be talking about today. Um, so a couple things. Um, I wanna really focus today just on the subleasing strategy because I know that's where most of you uh, probably are, are interested in. Now, I always, before I go into that, I do recommend that you get into the purchasing strategies and make that your long-term goal um, because that's where you're gonna create long-term wealth, right? But subleasing is a phenomenal way. It's a great way to get your feet wet, to get started, to gain some experience. By the way, guys, if you guys have any questions at any given time, feel free to type them in the comments here on YouTube, and I'll make sure to uh, answer uh, those questions. And I'm also going to have uh, Lupita, who's going to be assisting me with answering and moderating uh, with some of those questions. But I want to focus on the subleasing model, like I said, because most people are in a position where they could sublease and then build that up to later go into buying property so that they could create long-term wealth. So now let's jump right into the training. So the first thing is what is subleasing, right? So subleasing is the process where you rent a property, get permission in writing from the property owner, and then you launch it as a short-term rental. Yes, it's legal. And again, yes, we get permission in writing. I actually just finished uh, filming a YouTube video right now where I talked about some of the biggest mistakes. And that's one of the biggest mistakes is a lot of people will message me on Instagram and say, hey, Jorge, I, you know, the landlord just found out. They're going to shut me down. What do I do? And I'm like, well, you should have learned how to get permission and how to do this correctly so that you can have a sustainable and scalable business model. But subleasing, again, that's exactly how it works. Uh, you get permission in writing. Typically, we sign a 12-month lease. Uh, we pay the first month, deposit, furniture, decor, pictures, and boom, you're basically up and running. Uh, a common question that I get, and I want to acknowledge this up front, is, hey, Jorge, why would the landlords actually allow us uh, to use their property as a short-term rental? If it's so profitable, why wouldn't they do it themselves? Now, the example that I like to give is if you look at people that own a restaurant, a barbershop, and a nail salon. 99% of the time, the people who own those businesses do not own their real estate. They got permission in writing from whoever owns a real estate to basically launch their business, the, the uh, restaurant, barbershop, nail salon. 
the even though the owner of the land could have those three types of businesses, they don't want to be they don't want to be involved in anything that requires operations. These land owners just want what we call mailbox money. They want it completely passive. They want it hands off. They don't want to be involved in anything. Well, the exact same. Um, this works the exact same way, right? The owners of these properties don't know how to run a short-term rental business. A lot of them, in fact, are nine of fivers who have no business experience. They just happen to own a property or two, which most people that own uh, real estate in the U.S., they mostly own one or two properties, right? So it's like a small mom and pop little, you know, two, two properties at most. And again, they don't have that entrepreneur experience. They don't know how to hire. They don't know how to delegate, automate. They don't know about accounting, the legal side, how to build t systems, teams, operations, how to scale the business. That's not their experience. They're just, ha they just happen to want to park some money in real estate and make passive income from the long-term rentals. And that's why they allow us, as long as we provide a win-win relationship, we pay them on time, make sure there's no issues with the neighbors, respect the properties, they are happy to work with us. In fact, 100% of my sublease properties, I have uh, renewed the lease agreements because we've had a great relationship. We've created a win-win. Okay. Um, the next thing that I want to talk about is, you know, not all properties are created equal. So what should we look for in properties that make it either a good property or a bad property? I hope you guys are taking notes because no takers are money makers. And this is something you might want to write down. Uh, the first thing whenever you are subleasing a property is that it must be renovated. Speaking from experience, I have this one short term rental, still have it today in uh, sunny San Diego, California. I've actually never seen this Airbnb. I launched it completely virtual almost three years ago. It's making like 3K a month of cash flow, probably like the lowest out of all my properties. And that's because the property is actually not renovated. It is very outdated. And every maybe 20, 25% of our reservations, somebody's asking for a, a partial refund because it's not in good condition. It doesn't look uh, the way it looks in the pictures, right? Uh, great marketing, right? You want to make sure you hire real estate photographers for all of your uh, Airbnbs. It's it's an area that you don't want to cut a corners in. But going back to the story, the owners uh, from the very beginning were unwilling to make changes. They said that all the money they got from rent was basically to put their kids through college and all these things. And so that experience taught me is like, you know what? Only acquire subleases with um, properties that are completely renovated and turnkey. Even if you have the money to renovate, you don't want to renovate a property that you don't own. You want to make sure that it's already turnkey and renovated. So that's number one. The second thing you want to look for when qualifying properties is to make sure that it has AC and heat for obvious reasons. Number three, you want to make sure the property has parking uh, if you're hosting from one to four people, then one parking space is good. If you're hosting like five to eight, then you want to make sure you have two uh, parking spaces that are specifically only for your guest. Okay. Uh, again, I used to have a property. It was actually my very first Airbnb five years ago, and we were hosting up to eight people, which based on what I just shared, we needed two designated uh, parking spaces and we only had one. So every time there was five to eight people staying at the property. Um, there was always complaints about the parking because they had to park two or three miles away, uh, two or three blocks away. And sometimes they were just arriving from lots of travels. Um, they were, you know, maybe tired, wanted to just get some sleep, but they were unable to do that because, or they could eventually, but they had to park really far away. And then finally, they were able to get in. So make sure that property has one to two spaces, depending on how many people you're hosting. Uh, so again, we covered uh, renovated parking, AC and heat. The next thing that I look for uh, is, is a two bedroom, one bath or uh, apartment or a three bedroom, two bath house. How do you pick which one you should go with? Well, it depends on your finances. If you have the additional finances, I would say go with the three, two, because 
single family homes, in my experience, will give you a better return on investment, more cash flow, more profit. You more profit, you can have larger groups of people and have provide a great experience at a fraction of the cost. Uh, however, if finances are tight, you can definitely start with a smaller unit, like a two bedroom, one bathroom apartment, condo, townhome, uh, so on and so forth. Uh, so those are the four. So three, two, uh, or a two, one, if it's a three, two single family home, I recommend 1100 square feet minimum or more, the more the merrier. And if it's a two, one, I recommend, uh, minimum, uh, 700 square feet. If it's smaller than for those two examples, it might be difficult to uh, to host the amount of people that you might want to host in order to really increase your profitability. Uh, I do have one more and it's more of a bonus. And that is if the property is already furnished and or has appliances. Of course, if you have a property that's furnished and it has appliances, it's going to keep a lot more money in your pocket. And it's only going to increase your return on investment. Why? Typically, our you know mindset when we are looking to acquire subleases is the we want to get in there with as little money out of pocket. Like, let me give you an example. I would rather put twenty thousand dollars to get two properties than to just get one, right? Because I can have you to have better utility of my capital, have a better return on investment. So the least I can go in there with the better. Uh, so those are really the five things that I look for. And again, if you have questions at any time, uh, feel free to uh, just comment here. And uh, myself and uh, Lupita, who's helping me answer the questions, will support you there. And if you guys are not already subscribed to my YouTube channel, make sure you guys do that right now and also turn on the notification bell. We're going to be uploading videos every single week, um, every Monday and Wednesday as of right now. And in the future, we do plan on adding a third video per week. Everything solely focused on helping you create success with Airbnb. All right. So now let's talk about some of the mistakes to avoid. By the way, guys, do me a favor. If you guys can copy this stream link and maybe share it with somebody else, let's uh, let's kick in that out. Let's let the algorithm here on YouTube know that this is some great content and let's change more lives. So mistakes to avoid. So mistakes to avoid. One of the things that you want to avoid um, is having properties that are on a main street. Again, from experience, I used to have this property that I was on, that was on a main street uh, that would take you directly into the freeway. So people were going super fast, like 55, 60 miles an hour on a residential street. And it was it made it very dangerous for the people who were staying at the Airbnb to get in and out of the driveway because people were just zoom, going super fast. Two, the families didn't feel safe having their kids play outside in the front yard. Three, it was really noisy. Even when they were sleeping inside, you could hear the cars going by. So uh, for all those reasons and many more, you just want to stay away from properties that are on a main street. You want to stay in areas where you are in a nice, clean, safe residential area so that way the families feel comfortable as well. I love on the main street. Exactly, right? Um, another mistake to avoid is avoid properties that are near. I always used to say on or near a train station, but that would be kind of weird to have a property on a train station. But what I mean is near a train station or near train tracks. Again, I could just imagine a family, um, you know, showing up to the property. They're tired. They want to take a nap. And all of a sudden they hear the train and now they can't sleep because it's too close. So you want to make sure that it's really, really far enough. Like even where I now live, there's a train like four miles away and I could hear it like, it's very like very lightly, but I could hear it. So I could only imagine if I could he slightly hear one that's four miles away, just imagine a train going by if it's, I don't know, a week, two weeks, three weeks, four weeks, five uh, weeks. What am I talking about? Weeks, blocks, one, two, three, four, five blocks. It's been a long day of recording a lot of content today, but uh, you guys get the point. Stay away from properties that are near a train station or 
train tracks. It's just not a good idea. A uh, couple other things to avoid. Make sure you verify the city ordinance. This is another one. I get people messaging me all the time on Instagram. Hey, Jorge, I got a notice from the city and they're telling me I got to shut down because I didn't know that uh, you actually can't operate short-term rentals or they're telling me I need a permit and whatever the case may be. You want to make sure that you get in contact with the city. And here's how you do it. You just go on Google and you type building department, like this is me typing building department. Actually, when I type, it looks it looks more like this, right? So building departments, pretty fast, in the city of, and then whatever city it is. And when you call, when, when you Google that, their phone number is going to pop up. And you're going to say, hello, my name is Jorge. I am interested in um, your short-term rental ordinance, you know, like, can I operate a short-term rental? Don't say Airbnb. Airbnb is the company and they have, you know, a majority market share, kind of just like Uber. The proper term is STR, short-term rental. So you want to ask them, what is your short-term rental ordinance? And they're going to say three possibilities. Possibility number one, hey, Jorge, uh, you actually don't need a permit here. We actually don't regulate it. Boom. If they say that, that they don't regulate it, I don't need a permit, I will go in there and launch my short-term rental. Possibility number two is, hey, Jorge, you could, you can operate a short-term rental. You just need to get a permit. Great. What is the permit process? How do I pay for it? How much is it? And then we get the permit and then we launch this baby. Possibility number three is we don't allow Airbnbs. They're not allowed in this area, period. Now, the good thing is, in my experience, about 97%, okay, 97% of cities, you either don't need a permit or you get a permit. It's only in about 3% of cities where you actually are not allowed uh, to launch, period, okay? So don't go through all the time and energy investing all that money to launching in the area where you're not able to launch and should it be launching because it's going to be short-lived. If you want to maximize your time, your money, and build a sustainable and scalable business, go into an area where they don't regulate and you don't need a permit or where you can simply get a permit. Just keep it that simple. Okay. Another big one is that if you're getting, uh, if you're going into the subleasing, right, make sure... <laughs> Sometimes uh, common sense is not so common, right? You want to make sure you get permission in writing from the property owners. Again, I get this question all the time on Instagram, on the DMs. Hey, Jorge, the owners found out I'm doing Airbnb. They're kicking me out. It's like, well, that's true because in every lease agreement, it states no subleasing allowed. Why? Because you are supposed to live there if you're telling them you're going to live there, right? If you're saying you're going to live there, they're going to tell you you can't rent it out to other people. So what you need to do is get permission in writing from the property owner, right? Talk to them about you wanting to run a short-term rental business uh, on their property. Provide them with the education, the knowledge, the know-how necessary for them to make an educated decision. And I say educated decision because in my experience, when a property owner says no to subleasing, check this out. It is only because we have failed or you have failed to educate them enough to understand the business enough to say yes. Okay. So just like anything, it's going to take practice. It's going to take time. But perfect practice makes perfect. Does that make sense? Um, so get permission in writing, verify the city ordinance. Okay. Here's another one. This is a big one too. Okay. You want to make sure that you validate if certain areas are profitable before you launch. Like if you go right now and you're like, Oh, I really like this city. And you go and launch an Airbnb. You're basically flipping a coin 50, 50 chance, whether you're going to make money or not. So you only want to launch in an area that you have already validated, if it makes sense. By the way, I see uh, 17 of you on this YouTube live. Do me a favor, guys. Hit that little thumbs up right now. Hit that thumbs up so that we can get more people here. I would really, really appreciate it. Um, so 
those are a lot of things, guys. Verifying the ordinance. By the way, uh, with the softwares, right, you can use softwares like MashVisor or AirDNA. There's a lot of softwares out there. Um, and typically, you want to make sure that the property you are looking to launch and, you're, and that you're comparing to properties that are already actively on Airbnb, you want to make sure they are similar in bedrooms, bathroom, square footage, amenities, ba uh, bedrooms, bathroom, square footage, amenities, and location. Meaning, if I want to launch a property, I don't know, uh, on the beach, but the comps I'm getting are like inland, like away from the beach. And it's a different type of property with different amount of bedrooms and bathrooms. That's not going to work, right? They need to be similar. So if I'm looking to launch a, say a three bedroom, two bathroom pool house, five miles from the beach, and it's 1500 square feet, I ideally want to find other three twos, 1500 square feet around five miles from the beach, also with the pool that are already active at, on Airbnb. And I want to look at the revenue that they've brought in, not just this month, but in the last 12 months. Then I can analyze and be like, okay, I'm going to rent this property for $2,500 a month. But I see other properties making $5,000 to $7,500 a month. Boom. That's a no-brainer. I know that I'm going to make two to three k minimum of profit in this Airbnb. Then it's not a matter of if I'm going to cash flow. It's just a matter of how much I'm going to cash flow. Does that make sense? So those are some of the tips there. Okay. Um, what else? Uh, as far as the comps, I want to make sure that, the, that I get two to three. I don't want to just see only one property being profitable. That's not enough for me to go into the area. I need to see two, ideally three, similar to the one I, to what I described bedrooms, bathrooms, square footage, amenities, location in order to go in there and launch. Another thing is whenever you look at these softwares, you, you'll be able to see how many short-term rentals there are in the area. You want to make sure there's already at, at the minimum 30 active short-term rentals in the area. If you see, if you see that there are a lot less, um, then it might not be a good area to go into. So again, you want to see that there are already 30 active short-term rentals in that city, okay? If you see that there's only five or eight, there may not be enough demand, okay? Um, and you won't have that great of a return on investment as if you had way beyond 30. And it's interesting because, you know, some of the cities that we're operating in, there's 600, 1,000 plus active Airbnbs. And people will look at that and be like, well, is, does, doesn't that make it saturated, Jorge? Like, isn't that too many Airbnbs? It's like, well, it depends. Let's look at their revenue and their occupancy. If they have low occupancy and low revenues, then that means it is saturated. Uh, but in a lot of cases, it just means that there is that much demand that all these Airbnbs, the amount of all these Airbnbs, they could be operating right now um, and then it's just about how can you take what's already working and make it better meaning you could take a look at some of the short-term rentals in the area that are doing well that are doubling or tripling whatever they pay in rent and then ask yourself what could i do to make my airbnb better than what already exists okay um couple other things. I want to talk a little bit about mindset. We just talked a lot about strategies. I want to do a little bit of mindset and then I want to go into a little bit of Q&A and then we'll wrap it up. But again, I see 21 people on the live, but only 13 likes. Por qué? What's going on here, guys? I need the other eight of you, nine of you to hit that thumbs up like button on YouTube. Thank you guys so much. And make sure you guys subscribe. Let's talk a little bit about the mindset. Okay. First, why would you want to start an Airbnb business? Why go into business? Why become an entrepreneur? Well, if you are somebody that wants to create time freedom, the only way that you can create time freedom is by being a successful business owner because not all business owners have time freedom. You don't start a business and then magically have time freedom. You have to learn how to build a team in a system that works even when you don't. Just like if you owned a franchise, like 
McDonald's, crappy food, great business systems. If you own a McDonald's, you don't have to be there in order to make cash flow. The business runs itself. There's managements, there's teams, there's systems, and they work even when the owner doesn't. We operate our short-term rentals the exact same way. We start, we build a team and a system that basically runs the business so that we can work on the business, not in the business. Okay. So with entrepreneurship, you have the ability to create time freedom when you structure the business correctly. That's why you should be a business owner. Um, otherwise, you'll be at the same nine to five for the next 20 to 30 years. Uh, for some people, that'll be good. But for most people, no, because there's a, it's a proven fact that only 15% of people are satisfied in the workplace. The other 85% are unsatisfied. They feel overworked, underpaid, underappreciated. And in order to make more money, they got to work more hours, which means less time away from their family, less time doing the things that they enjoy with the people they love. So if you want time freedom, starting a business is the only way you could do that because you are not trading time for money. Next thing, why invest your money into Airbnb? Well, Robert Kiyosaki of Rich Dad Poor Dad says that cash is trash and savers are losers. If you look at uh, what's been happening in the last few years, there's something called quantitative easing where the government is printing trillions and trillions of dollars. In fact, 30% of our money in circulation today was printed in 2020. Let me say that again. 30% of our money in circulation, hundreds of years that, that of, of money in circulation, 30% of it was created in 2020. Remember the trillions and trillions of dollars of stimulus and all that stuff? Well, what happens when you continue to print money over and over and over? It devalues the existing supply. So if you have $100,000 in your bank account right now, a year from now, it'll still say 100000 with numbers, but you will only have the purchasing power of about 85000 because inflation right now is like at 15%. And I believe that pretty soon it'll be at about 20%. That means that your money is depreciating, is losing its purchasing power right now by about 15% every single year. And here's the crazy part. Growing up, most of us here are taught, save your money, save your money, save your money, save your money. But why would you say something that is continuing to lose its value? So the middle class and the poor save their money. The rich and wealthy invest their money. So if you want to go from middle class to become wealthy, you have to learn how to invest your money. Okay, <clears throat> so next thing, when it comes to taxes, right, there are four people that make up the world of business, employees, self-employed, business owners, and investors. Taxes have always been in favor of entrepreneurs, business owners, and investors. Um, it's funny enough, though, employees and self-employed always think that taxes are on their side, but... It's not true. On the left side of the quadrant, as an employee, self-employed, the more money you make, the more taxes you pay. When you're an entrepreneur or investor, the more money you make, the less taxes you make. I'm sorry, the less taxes you pay legally by following the tax code. And by starting a business specifically in the real estate field, and a you know, great example with Airbnb, there's a lot of tax deductions and write-offs that you have access to that you otherwise wouldn't be able to take if you were just an employee or self-employed. So it's very important that you go from a saving mindset to an investing mindset. Now, I do believe that saving is good for your bills and emergency fund. But other than that, again, cash is trash and savers are losers. You have to learn how to invest your money and make your money work for you. Yes, yes. Um, what else? Well, I think I pretty much covered all the content. It's been about 30 minutes of just content and I want to do a little bit of Q and a, so if you guys have some questions, please type them in the chat and let's get to them. Uh, let me see if there's a, I think I already got a couple of questions here. Hey, Jorge, what if I 
when, uh, when talking to the property owner, they ask you for the business name of your short-term rental business. Well, then you give them your business name, right? Um, just come get a, get, get a business name. You can set up a DBA. You can set up an LLC uh, just to give you a little bit more of credibility. And by setting up your LLC, you could also start building business credit. Uh, let me see here. It's at 22 likes, maybe refresh in order to see it. Thank you. How do you find the rental of other properties? We look at softwares, again, like MashVisor or AirDNA. Another question, how do you see what their revenue has been in the last 12 months with the same softwares? Uh, what are the ordinances in San Diego and Long Beach? Uh, you just need to get a permit. That's it. Yep. Let's see other questions. What about HOA? You want to typically stay away from HOA communities. Um, one of the states that I have seen where there are more, um, where they're very friendly and open to short-term rentals in HOA communities is in Florida. Most other, but again, I not everywhere, just a lot of places that I've seen because I have a lot of students in Florida, but we're all over the states, right? Uh, but in most other places, they're not very open to short-term rentals in HOA communities, which stands for Homeowners Association. Um, so just stay away from HOA. That's it. They're not good properties to have in your portfolio. Anyway, uh, HOAs are terrible. All right. Let's see here. Let's see here. Other questions. Uh, Hello, Jorge. What's the first step to being to starting an Airbnb? Well, I would say the first thing is deciding which strategy you want to begin with, right? Which strategy do you want to start with? Two, making sure that you have the capital and the finances. Um, for anybody on Instagram, I'm answering the questions on YouTube. So come join me on my YouTube channel, D. Jorge Contreras. I'm answering questions there. Um so let's see, is it better to do Airbnb outside of California? Honestly, California is great, but you could pretty much launch anywhere. There's a lot of states. In fact, most states you can, as long as you find the proper niche areas um, and the right type of properties and you validate the revenue and occupancy, you can create a successful Airbnb business. Let's see here. Uh, I'm setting up my LLC now. Do you recommend an S Corp or C Corp? LLC. Uh, for rentals. Uh, let's see. Next question. Um, so it has to be agreed upon by the owner that you are renting from that you are going to be doing Airbnb rentals. Absolutely. You want to get permission in writing from the property owners. Yes. Next question. Hey, hi, Jorge. I'm super excited to begin this great venture. I'm um, setting up my LLC now. Do you recommend an S Corp or C Corp? Is that the same question from earlier? I think it is. Yep, LLC. Uh, VA cash out to invest or do you teach ways to get started? VA cash out. If you are referring to doing a cash out refinance, that could be a great way to access capital to then leverage into more subleases and or more, more purchases. Let's see here. More questions. Again, any questions, type them on the YouTube chat uh, down below. In terms of capital, I'm looking to do a VA cash out for my primary home to start by taking a course and get investment property. Is this a good tactic or do you teach ways to get capital? Uh, personally, I do teach ways um, how to access capital. I do teach that. Um so I guess it just depends. But one of the ways that I teach that is doing a cash out refi. So I would definitely go with that option for sure. And I agree on what you said. Uh, investing in ed your education is going to uh, highly increase your probabilities of being successful right off the bat. Uh, so you don't have to reinvent the wheel and go through all the mistakes yourself. How do you identify properties that allow sublease? Uh, you don't. There isn't like a website where you go and, and says, oh, all of these allow. No. You want to call the landlords and basically talk to them over the phone. You're welcome. Uh, for tax filing as an S-corp or C-corp? Um, 
as an S corp. Do you have students in New Jersey? Also, do you have to, do you have to be near a big city? So yes, I do have students in New Jersey and it helps if you are in a big city where there's a lot of tourism, a lot of a uh, high pop, a large population, there's going to be a lot of opportunity, but then there's a lot of places where it's a smaller population. Maybe it's a desert area or a lake area or a, just any vacation destination away from the big cities. And those areas do really well too. But that's why it's hard to say like just a black or white, like yes, no, because it truly depends. And that's why looking at the softwares to, to in order to look at the revenue and occupancy of existing Airbnbs in order to determine if that area you're interested in makes sense. Uh, let's see. Um, when you say get the homeowner's permission in writing, what exactly do you mean? How would I go about getting it in official writing? Well, you have to speak to the property owners or the manager, whoever is the point of contact and talk to them about you wanting to start your short-term rental business. And I did actually, we, we are uploading videos on this YouTube channel where I'm specifically breaking down how to property, how to properly speak to property owners, what to say, how to overcome objections. So make sure you guys are subscribed to my YouTube channel and turn on your notification uh, notification bell because we will be uploading videos uh, every Monday and every Wednesday. So super, super excited. I live near the Banks Vernonia Trail. We get a lot of bicyclists and no place to stay. There are three Airbnbs there. I'm in a small rural town, 30 minutes west of Portland. Awesome. Uh, how would you convince them if you've never done it before? Well, if you look at everybody that has a subleasing business today, none of them were born with subleases. Every single person, including myself, started with their first one. So it's just about building relationship, building rapport, um, you know, just connecting with them and figuring out what's important to them, you know, um, meeting their needs and meeting your needs at the same time, just creating a win-win relationship. Uh, let's see what else here. What do you do if you have no experience with short-term rentals and the property owner asks how many you have done before? Well, you could be honest and say this is your first one. However, if you have strong financials, strong credit, uh, that could really help in building your credibility. Uh, maybe whatever you do as a you know for a career as well. Um, it could also be that uh, maybe you have friends, or if you're involved in a community, maybe you can use their properties as leverage. Um, in the real system Airbnb coaching program, we've had over three thousand students go through our program. And right now we have about 1,000 active students. So whenever we do, when we do the coaching calls every single week, I actually do a little bit of networking and my students are able to connect with each other um, from all over the U.S. on a Zoom coaching call that we do every week. And they exchange information so that they could be each other's references and they can support each other, maybe even potential business partnerships in the future. There's just a lot of possibilities, right? Let's see more questions here. Um, you have great rebuttals there. You got to be, you got to, you've got to get good at, you know, speaking to landlords to be successful in the business or someone just has to do it for you. Like you don't have to be good at speaking to landlords, but somebody does. So yeah, like in the real system, we have, um, one of our coaches actually offers that as a service where they can actually get a yes for you from a landlord, but you would need to be in the community to be able to connect with them. Let's see here. Do you have a group where we can chat with existing students and their success? I would love to talk to one of them. Uh, yeah, definitely. Uh, you guys can message me on Instagram and um, you'll be able to see a lot like hundreds of testimonials there. What else? Uh, what's constantly, what's constant necessity for Airbnb besides a loyal cleaning crew? So there's three operations in a short-term rental business, whether you own it, sublease it, or co-hosting. One, it is, uh, by the way, if you're on this YouTube uh, live right now, make sure you hit the like button, all right? The little thumbs up and 
let's get more likes. And if you guys haven't already, make sure you guys subscribe and turn on your notifications. So there are three operations, whether you own it, sublease it, or co-host it, and that is cleaning, maintenance, and communication. Your cleaning is going to be on an ongoing basis, okay? There's going to be typically four to eight cleanings per month on average because uh, most people stay anywhere from two to five nights. Um, the second one is communication. That's going to be ongoing um, almost every day, but all communications are done from your phone. So that is completely and 100% virtual. The third one is maintenance. The maintenance is from time to time um, whenever uh, it's needed. So like if your cleaning staff is cleaning, right? Because that's what they do, right? Your cleaning staff is cleaning and they notice that there's like a leak or a small repair that needs to happen. They can actually contact your handyman directly to get it taken care of. And that way you maintain your property at a five-star experience uh, before the next guest checks in. So when you delegate the cleaning and the maintenance, now you as the Airbnb host at the beginning can do just the communications. Now you have a team, you have some scalability where you're not running the business like an employee doing everything. And instead of cleaning or doing maintenance yourself, go and find your next Airbnb. Does that make sense? That's how you grow is work on the business, not in the business. Next question. Uh, what's the best conversation pitch to a landlord and let them agree to your rental? Honestly, it's being, it's transparency. It's being completely honest with the business model. Like in the past, I've had a lot of people who reached out to me and said, that they would contact property owners and basically lie to them and then just do it behind their back. But again, that's just a matter of when, not if you get caught. It's much better to just be upfront, be transparent, uh, get permission in writing. That's always going to be the best conversation pitch. Honesty, transparency. How, how, do, how do confident... Uh, okay. How confident do you feel that your Airbnb, wait, hold up. How do, am I dyslexic or am I? Yeah. Let me see. How do feel confident that your unit will be profitable and not in the negative? Well, the way we handle that is by utilizing these softwares. We can verify that short-term rentals are already profitable in that area before we decide to go there. Like I mentioned, if you just flip a coin, pick an area or like grab a dart and go and just throw it on the map and be like, oh, I'm going to launch right there. Well, that's how you could be in the negative because you have no idea if that area actually makes sense. Therefore, make sure, again, that um, you're doing it in areas where you already validated that it makes sense. Okay. Um, best time to get a business credit card for your Airbnb yesterday. The best time to have gotten an Airbnb was yesterday. The second best time is today. The best time to have gotten a, to started to have started building business credit was yesterday. The second best time today. Hey guys, for all of you on Instagram, join me on YouTube because we're doing the YouTube live there. And that's where I'm answering all the questions. Just go to my YouTube uh, the Jorge Contreras. Everybody who's on the YouTube live, thank you for being here. Make sure you guys hit that thumbs up so we can get more people here uh, on the live. Next thing, we're answering more questions, giving some free Q&A, giving some value, helping you grow your income with Airbnb. Let's see here. When you say uh, you help build a team, what do you mean? Would we be independent or on a team? Well, if you're talking about the coaching part, right, we basically provide coaching to teach you how to acquire, launch, automate your Airbnb uh, in 30 days or less without owning property. We show you how to build a team, how to build a system, anything from LLCs, business credit cards, even growing and improving your personal credit, all that stuff, uh, everything from A to Z, really. That's what I meant. But yeah, you're basically uh, completely independent, right? We don't take a profit from your Airbnb. 
how much do you pay a cleaning crew for a 3-2? So this really depends, right? Like if you're launching in, say, uh, Austin, Texas versus like, I don't know, a small town in the Midwest, it's going to be night and day. The prices are going to be very different uh, just because it has a lot to do with how expensive and you know, labor and all that stuff in that area. But I do have like a business model and it's typically uh, $25 per bedroom, per bathroom, per living space. So if it's a three, two, that means that's three plus two plus living space, six times 25 is 150. And that's going to work about 80% of the time. But again, it really depends. Let's see. Are you concerned about the economy and the potential recession that will slow down of people wanting to travel? Well, we actually have a great solution and we proved it through the uh, everything that happened in 2020, right? And so what we did is we basically implemented a strategy that I call a staycation experience. And so a lot of our properties have a pool, a spa, and a game room. And what it did is we attracted locals. So yes, in 2020, there was a decrease of people traveling by plane, which only created an increase of people traveling by car because people were sick and tired of being sick and tired of being stuck at home. So people from the same city and nearby cities were staying at our Airbnbs. Powerful, right? Because they wanted to, again, social distance and have a great experience at a fraction of the time. They wanted to social distance. They couldn't do that at a hotel, but they could do that at one of my houses. So we do. We would do the exact same thing. Um, there's a lot of opportunity. And if you make your properties the most marketable in your area, you could become and basically have like the top 1% of properties in your area, but you have to know how many bedrooms, bathrooms, square footage, amenities, what locations, how to communicate with landlords, the legal aspect, the tax aspect, building a team, building a system. Like there's a lot that goes into the business, right? It's not just upload a property to Airbnb. Let's see. Can you use an LLC for two purposes? Let's say filmmaking and short-term rentals. You can, but you shouldn't is a simple answer. Ideally, you want each of your businesses to have their own entity. I'm a beginner and would like to know what sort of uh, target occupancy rates uh, you would look for before diving into that market. Well, I don't look at just the uh, occupancy. I look at the revenue as well, right? Let me give you an example. Let's say you're renting a property for... 4000 a month. Let's assume it's a really nice high-end property. But let's say you're charging 500 a night. Well, if you're charging 500 a night and your rent is 4000 after 8 nights, you break even. Well, let's say that you had a total of 15 days booked every month. That means 7 the first 8 nights break even. The next 7 nights you're in profit. Seven nights times 500 is 3,500. You could be making $3,500 of profit with a 50% occupancy. Hmm. You see what I mean? So you don't want to look at just the occupancy. It needs to be a combination of occupancy and revenue. And together, based on those two figures, you make a decision as to if that's profitable or not. Okay. Uh, just wondering how much your course is for subleasing and how much capital you need to start. So um, it's a loaded answer, which I don't want to talk. I want to come in here and just share valuable free information. Uh, if you're interested in the coaching, uh, send me a message on Instagram. Uh, I Make sure you follow me on the correct page because there are a couple fake Instagram profiles out there that are trying to scam people about crypto and all this stuff. And I don't talk about crypto. Crypto is cool, but my main focus is Airbnb. Um, so on my only page that I run, there's 131,000 followers. If there's anything other than 131,000, it's a fake page. Report it. But message me on Instagram. 
Uh, if you're interested and we'll talk about it because some of the programs are group coaching only. Some of them come with a one-on-one coach. Some of them come with a in-person master, like three in-person events in addition to a one-on-one and group. Uh, we can also lock up the first sublease for you. So like, it just really depends on your goals, your finances. Uh, but yeah, by the way, we do have our next in-person two-day mastermind at the end of April in Southern California. So just message me on Instagram and I'll be happy to uh, uh, give you guys the info. I just posted my Instagram uh, channel here on YouTube. So check it out. That way you guys have the direct link. Uh, let me see here. Always with the fresh fade. Got to. <clears throat> Got to. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> let's see here. Uh, let's answer a couple more questions here. Uh, let's see here. What's the minimum annual revenue? Are you looking per property? Is 25,000 good? So Francis, I don't look at minimum of revenue. I look at minimum of profit and the minimum profit that we look to make with each Airbnb is 2000 a month, which is 24,000 a year profit. Okay. Like take home after all expenses. Because when you say revenue, that's how much in total comes in, but that doesn't say how much profit, right? Uh, let's see here. Quick hack to find out if the page is fake. Scroll down and look when the oldest pictures were posted. It will show a super recent date. That's a really good post. Thank you, Matthew. That's my barber right there. Appreciate you, bro. He got me fresh this morning. Um, but yeah, that's true. If there's a fake Instagram page, they probably made it in the last couple of days or weeks where you, when you go onto my page, I've been talking about Airbnb for like five years now. And I've been talking about real estate for almost 10 years since I started investing in uh, 2012. Let's see. Do you immediately get turned off to markets with regulations? Actually, no, I get turned on to markets with regulations. I prefer if they already have an ordinance where they require a permit. Because again, I'll have a sustainable, scalable business model. I know the ordinance is not going to change. And if they do, it'll be slightly, ideally. So I prefer if they, if they require a permit. Hey, Jorge, what's a good way to get into Airbnb with no experience? Well, I would first educate yourself because the less you know, the more risky it is. The more you know, the less risky it is. And the fastest way to learn is to find somebody who has the results and outcome that you desire and learn from them. Does that make sense? Let's see, other questions here. Uh, other questions, other questions. Other questions. Again, make sure you guys subscribe and turn on the notification bell here on the YouTube channel. We're gonna be dropping videos every Monday and every Wednesday. I also have a podcast. You guys have got to download my podcast on iTunes. We drop episodes every Monday. And if you want the video format of the podcast, we do have a separate YouTube channel called The Jorge Contreras Show. Let's see here. Uh, other questions. Are you doing this nationally or staying in your local areas? So we currently have students all over the U.S. And I mean all over the U.S. So pretty much everywhere. Other questions here. Thank you so much for doing this free video, dude. Big time vibes. You got it, Matt. Appreciate you, bro. Thank you all for uh, coming on here. I appreciate it. Um, let's see. I'll take a couple more questions. Do you have a service where we can sit down and map out the area and see what's a good place one on one and then also with the and then also help with closing that landlord at least for the first one to get confidence? Yes, we do offer that coaching service. Uh again, probably the best place to DM me is on Instagram and we could talk about it. Yeah, thanks Jorge, you are the man. You're the man, Jake. Appreciate you. Other questions? Let's see here. All right, guys. I think that about wraps it up. So, hey, guys, um, I'm going to stick around on the Instagram, so don't go nowhere. 
For YouTube, I'm going to wrap it up right there. I do want to mention, uh, again, if you're, on my, if you're here on the YouTube Live or you're watching this on the replay, uh, subscribe, turn on the notification bell. And I do have a free ebook in the description of my videos that you guys can check out. And again, for those of you here on YouTube, follow, check me out on Instagram. Uh, there's my link on the chat. And also check out my free podcast uh, on iTunes. We upload videos also every Monday. And again, my goal is to help you create time, financial, and location freedom by starting an Airbnb empire without owning real estate. Uh, personally, I'm doing over 100000 a month from my um, Airbnb business. Okay. So uh, in case you were wondering, I currently am doing the subleasing, <clears throat> the purchasing, and the management model. And I've coached over 3,000 people um, as of April 4th, today, 2022, in starting their Airbnb business. So again, everybody here on YouTube, subscribe, turn on the notification bell. And uh, we're about to hit 100,000 subscribers before the end of the year. We're going hard. Again, two videos a week, every Monday, every Wednesday. And pretty soon we'll start uploading three videos a week. So hey, from the bottom of my heart, appreciate uh, every single one of you for investing the last you know one hour here of your time. I hope that it was valuable. And uh, subscribe, turn on the notification bell, and make sure you guys connect with me on Instagram. Thank you guys so much, and I'll see you guys next time.